if we segue from the muscle nicely over to protein, which obviously has a strong connection, it's been, you know, over 20 plus years of doing it, it's nice to see that protein sort of come full, full circle in terms of being able to support health and wellness and longevity. And of course, the brain, as you outlined in the book, could you talk us through protein in the brain and maybe some of your favorite uh, proteins to include on, on the plate to support the brain? Yeah. So, you know, the brain, like all other organs, needs every essential nutrient, uh, both micronutrients like vitamins and minerals and macronutrients, protein and fat. It doesn't, it uses glucose, uh, but it, but it doesn't need to come from the diet. So uh, the, the essential macronutrients are protein and fat. Um, and then carbohydrate is entirely optional because your body can make its own carbohydrate and, and, and blood sugar out of protein and fat. So in terms of uh, how much protein the brain needs, uh, it's really, um, uh, it's the amount that is ideal for your whole body and brain. And I have some equations in the book to help people estimate what they're, you know, what, where they might want to start. It, it, these are just starting points. The, uh, the, there's really no, even now in 2024, no consensus about how much protein is optimal for people to eat. But I do think that, uh, I, I think I'm not alone in, 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 uh, in saying that the conventional guidelines about how much protein we should, should eat have been too low. And so you do need adequate protein. And depending on what your diet looks like, you may even need more than your average amount of protein uh, to, to fuel your body properly. So, and protein requirements vary. They, they vary depending on your age, your activity level, your health status, um, uh, lots of other, but whether, whether or not you're pregnant, whether or not you're ill, injured, uh, lots of different factors. So, but they, but they do fall within, within a certain range that sort of makes sense to think about. So um, at maybe an upper limit would be something like one gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. Something like that would be an upper limit. Um, and uh, so I recommend a starting point, I think in the book is about 1.3 or 1.4 grams per kilogram ideal body weight. Um, but then, um, but, but then you can, you can go up or down from there, depending on, you know, what you discover as you work through some of these plans. Um, but the protein is essential. And, and it's not really the protein that's essential. It's the amino acids that you're looking for, because not all proteins are created equal and not all proteins contain all of the amino acids that we need in uh, appropriate amounts. And really the animal foods are king when it comes to meeting your amino acid requirements. It's not that you can't do it on a, a vegan or vegetarian diet. You absolutely can. Um, you just need to know which, which are the best plant sources. And uh, tofu, for example, is really one of the best, um, most complete uh, amino acid uh, sources uh, in the plant food world. Um, but if you're looking at the animal foods, you can pick any animal food you like. They are all complete. They will all give you everything you need. You don't really have to think about it. So this is why it's, I think it's very important if you're seeking optimal health with, you know, without having to think about it, um, to, to make animal foods the, the core of your diet as opposed to animal proteins, as opposed to plant proteins, but you can work your way around that if you so choose. Great tips. Yeah, it's certainly important to start with the protein first as you're building out your plate. And really fascinating when we segue from muscle and we look at the sarcopenia research and you know, researchers like Theo Spoglu at Leeds Beckett, when we do look at that 1.2 grams per kilo or 1.4 grams per kilo as a way to protect muscle as we age. And of course, we see, as you're alluding to, benefits for the brain. And you know, we know as we increase protein, we increase micronutrients. So it's sort of a win-win on multiple fronts. Now, if we now, in the book, obviously, you do a great job of going through, you know, fats and different dietary patterns and, and strategies for doing that. If we fast forward and look at some key nutrients or supplements that people might be thinking about or, you know, for yourself, when we think about mental health, whether it's common deficiencies or insufficiencies that you see in your practice or whether it's certain nutrients that are coming down the pipeline that you find interesting, could you share some of those with us? Yeah. So, you know, I am definitely in a camp of, you know, only supplement when, when needed, uh, rather than kind of shotgun supplementation, meaning everybody should take a multivitamin. I am definitely not in that camp. Um, so I, I do, I'm a food first 
clinician. So I recommend that people try to get as many nutrients as they possibly can from whole foods as opposed to from supplements. But there are some people who will still need supplements and those include people who choose you know, uh, a dietary pattern that may not be providing all nutrients, such as people who prefer vegan diets, but it also includes um, people who are, um, you know, who eat a very limited or very kind of picky diet, and they, there's a lot of foods that they don't like or or have an aversion to. Some people on the autistic spectrum fall into that category. Um, and then it also applies to people, especially as we're getting older, some of us can uh, have difficulty absorbing nutrients uh, to, to, to their full extent um, as, as our gut ages and our systems age. And so what you can see over time, especially in older people, is more difficulty absorbing amino acids from the diet, more difficulty absorbing B12 from the diet, um, and things like that. And so you can, there, there are medicines that interfere with you know uh, absorption of certain nutrients. So even in a well-formulated diet, you can sometimes see nutrient deficiencies. And this is partly because, uh, but but in the general population, you will see nutrient deficiencies, not just in people who choose a vegan diet, but also in people who are eating omnivorous yeah. diets with plenty of animal foods in them because um, that we are told to base our diets on foods, plant foods, things like grains and beans and nuts and seeds that actively interfere with our ability to, to absorb nutrients. And so our, the base of our diet, what we're told to eat, is not just very poor in nutrients, because those foods are very poor in nutrients, the grains and the beans, for example, but they're also rich in anti-nutrients. So this may help to explain why you know, iron deficiency is rampant. You know, on, on average, 20% of women of reproductive age around the world, and, and in some places much higher than that, don't have enough iron in their bodies. And that's you know, if you don't have enough iron, you don't just have a blood problem, you have a brain problem because mm. the brain needs iron to make neurotransmitters like dopamine to and, and to create energy in the mitochondria. And so, you know, this is uh, nutrient deficiencies. It's ridiculous that we take it for granted or that we accept that it's normal for women to be iron deficient, that of course we weren't designed to be iron deficient. 